Hi, so in this video I want to give a bit of an overview of reactions in organic chemistry. This is just a big picture uh, sort of an explanation that we're going to look at. Um, and uh, the first thing I'm going to start off with by, is by telling you about something, uh, a mathematical formula that's, uh, or equation, which we don't even have to know the name of it, but I, I just want to give a, an overview of what it, it, it's about. It's called the uh, kloppmann salem uh, equation. And, uh, and essentially what it is is that these two researchers, they came up with uh, a, an equation which looked to try and unify all organic chemical uh, reactions. And essentially this equation has three parts to it, um, the components, which can be calculated. And the three parts all represent different aspects of chemical reactions, which uh, affect a particular reaction outcome. Um, so the first part uh, uh, over here is, has everything to do with what we call sterics. Uh, and sterics are things which um, prevent a reaction from occurring just because of size. So you'll already probably be familiar with the idea of, for instance, we can uh, take ethyl chloride and we can react it with a nucleophile such as hydroxide and it adds to this carbon, breaks this uh, carbon chlorine bond and we get a substitution reaction. Um, so that works very nicely. However, uh, if we tried exactly the same thing, but on tertiary butyl chloride like this, and we also added the same nucleophile uh, hydroxide and try to get that to do exactly the same thing to kick out the chlorine, that just does not work uh, at all. And the reason for that is sterics. It's steric hindrance. Uh, this carbon over here is extremely bulky because of these, uh, the, the tertiary butyl group, and so it's very difficult for this nucleophile to react with that. And, and, and more details about that will come out later, uh, later in the course. So one thing that we need to look out for in reactions is sterics. Is there something which is preventing reaction or uh, maybe making a reaction go uh, better uh, because there's no steric hindrance or uh, or not. Uh, the next section over here is a uh, is is a part of the equation that has to do with electrostatics of the reaction. So this one is um, right electrostatics. This one is a little bit more uh, complicated. Uh, in that it, what it's talking about is uh, Coulombic forces. Uh, so this is pluses and minuses that we're dealing with over here. And, and to a greater or lesser extent, pretty much all reactions have some component uh, of this. Uh, electrostatics play quite a pivotal role in terms of bringing, for instance, for bringing reagents together. So as an example, um, if I just do a very simple example of here, I'm, I've got a ketone. Uh, and a ketone, the bond over here, this pi bond, is actually polarized. It's not equal uh, distribution between the carbon and oxygen, but the oxygen is more electronegative, so there's actually a slight negative charge sitting on the oxygen and a slight positive charge sitting on the carbon atom over there. And what that does, that means that if we have a nucleophile, which for instance might be hydroxide again, and it's negatively charged, it is not going to go to the oxygen. Uh, it's not going to go there because that's a slight negative charge. It's going to be repelled from there. Um, however, it is going to be attracted and wanting, uh, wanting to go towards the carbon that is slightly positively charged. Um, in our previous example over here, we can see exactly the same sort of thing. This carbon-chlorine bond is polarized. The chlorine is more electronegative. The carbon is slightly positive, and so there's an attraction between the oxygen and this carbon that brings that nucleophile in and allows that uh, reaction to occur. So that's the electrostatic uh, component of the, uh, the, uh, the equation. The last part of the equation is something which we've been dealing with now in this course, and this is what is often referred to as the stereoelectronic uh, component. Um, and that's a fancy word, really, to actually be talking about our molecular orbitals. Um, essentially, this component over here of, uh, of a reaction is, is saying that, do we have good homo-lumo uh, interactions? Um, do the 
electrophile and the nucleophile, are they uh, perfectly aligned in order to, uh, to react? And so the same reaction can be uh, looked at over, over here. Uh, the nucleophile is the hydroxide, it's got the negative charge on it, it's got lone pairs of electrons, lone pair of electrons add to the LUMO, which is the pi star antibonding orbital of, uh, of, of this carbonyl of the ketone. So all of these things come together. So whenever we look at a reaction, and so what, what we should be able to do, I should be able to give you a number of different examples, which we'll do in class, um, where you can just look at them and say, uh, what are the features? And in all reactions, these features may feature. So it's just to say to what a greater or lesser extent you think uh, a reaction might be influenced uh, by these. All right. So <clears throat> having established the basics, just the things that kind of bring re reagents together and, and, and how reactions occur, in organic chemistry, one of the important things we need to look at is the concept of nucleophiles and electrophiles. Um, these are our negative type um, uh, reagents. Um, often these things uh, get referred to as Lewis bases. Uh, this is another term, a chemical term, which is perfectly acceptable uh, to replace uh, a nucleophile, is a Lewis base. And electrophiles are often referred to as Lewis acids. Um, so, and those are, as I say, completely acceptable terms. What we've learned already through our frontier molecular orbitals is that nucleophiles um, are the things that react via the highest occupied molecular orbital and electrophiles are the things that react with their lowest occupied molecular orbital. So those are the concepts between the two. The question of course is what makes a good nucleophile and what makes a good uh, electrophile. And so we've dealt with some of those concepts already. Good nucleophiles have high energy uh, homos Okay, high energy homos and good electrophiles will have low energy uh, glumos. And so what are the things that affect those two together? If we can identify that, we're actually being able to then say, ah, this thing must be a good nucleophile or it must be a good electrophile. So the things we're looking for with high energy um, homos is uh, the, the number one thing uh, to, to look at in, in a molecule, which is very easy to see, are lone pair electrons. Um, so lone pairs, as we've seen before, um, are high in energy because they don't combine. The lone pairs that are part of an atom, they never combine with any other uh, uh, molecular orbital. And so because they never combine, they never dropped in energy. And so they almost always are higher in, uh, in energy. Um, but so lone pairs can be found on a, many different things. So for instance, we've got uh, water, uh, simplistically, has lone pairs, and those can be nucleophilic. Um, and we also have hydroxide. Uh, and hydroxide, of course, has three lone pairs uh, around it, but it has a negative charge. Now, if you have a negative charge on an atom, it is a much, much better nucleophile than an uncharged uh, atom. And that's because that extras, extra electrons that give it a negative charge actually push the HOMO slightly higher. Uh, and so, um, because there's more electrons there, the energy level ends up being a bit higher. So negative charge is much better uh, than uh, just the neutral molecule in its first, uh, in its first instance. Um, the other thing to compare with is something that looks uh, for instance, uh, like this, uh, an oxygen that is negatively charged like this and the oxygen that is neg whoopsie, sorry, negatively charged as part of a carboxylate, apologize for that, um, as part of a carboxylate, both O minuses, but this O minus is resonance stabilized. Uh, and because of that, that O minus is not as nucleophilic as this one over there. So all of these examples of lone pairs um, which are nucleophilic, um, but within the co that context, we can start to analyze and decide which one might be a better nucleophile or, or not based on that. Um, the other thing to look out for in uh, as nucleophiles are things that are, this is new for this course in second year, um, are high energy 
sigma bonds. And a high energy sigma bond comes about as a result of, for our purposes, is the result of a carbon connected to something which is not as electronegative as carbon, all right, or is of a much less electronegative than, than carbon. So something is here connected to it that is not. Now, things that are more electronegative than carbon are things like chlorine, bromine, uh, oxygen, nitrogen, etc. The things that are less electronegative are the, uh, the metals. And one example of this would be a Grignard reagent such as MGBR. Magnesium is much less electronegative than carbon. And what that means is that the electron density now sits on the carbon, not the magnesium. But it's still a sigma bond between them. But this is a high energy sigma bond. And this is very nucleophilic. And we're going to see examples of this uh, happening. So this is one example, a carbon bonded to um, <coughs> A metal it's a very good one that you need to to look out for and in this course the other important ones to look out for are um, borohydride so a boron and a hydrogen boron is much less uh, well overall this this molecule is negatively charged and it represents a high energy sigma bond which is going to be nucleophilic and later on you're going to see the equivalent um, because below boron is aluminium, you're going to see exactly the same thing uh, that uh, uh, aluminium, um, lithium aluminium hydride, uh, the lithium salt of that, is also a high energy sigma bond. Um, so those are the two most important ones. This is great for making carbon carbon bonds, and these are very important for doing reductions. We're going to add an H minus, and we're going to see examples of that. So nucleophiles, lone pairs. High energy sigma bonds, and really these are the only two types of examples that we're going to see. This and this with a metal. Uh, you're going to see one other metal, and that is a, a lithium uh, over there. And the last one, and it really is only just getting a bit of a mention, uh, is pi bonds. So pi bonds can be nucleophilic, sometimes in molecules, but they're actually very, very weak. Um, these are not fantastic uh, uh, nucleophiles, but they can be nucleophilic. We do see examples of it, um, and so we just need to uh, be aware of it when we're looking out for uh, things that are nucleophilic. All right, so let's go to electrophiles. Electrophiles, we need low energy LUMOs, and there are two important ones which you're going to see uh, in this course. The one is the pi star antibonding orbital, which is represented. Um, which you've been able to, to, to draw out. It's low in energy. We've already established that. And the quintessential example of that is something uh, of like a ketone. So I'm just going to use formaldehyde. Um, and <clears throat> ketones, uh, this carbonyl group, the pi bond of a C, uh, CO, is a good electrophile. The oxygen is electronegative. It's pulling electron density away there. There's a slight positive charge over there. It's a weak bond, and a nucleophile is going to be able to add over there and break this pi bond uh, over there. So pi antibonding orbitals are really, really important uh, uh, ones. Except, of course, the pi, standard pi bonds, which are like a carbon-carbon bond. In that case, the bond is not polarized like it is over here. So if we have something that's polarizing, like oxygen or nitrogen, uh, then the pi star becomes uh, a good low-energy LUMO. Um, and you should think about that why, that this pi star is lower in energy than the equivalent carbon-carbon one. Uh, and then the other one that we're going to be looking at is the sigma star antibonding, uh, antibonding orbital. And essentially, these ones are any carbon that has a good leaving group bonded to it. And what are we looking for in a good leaving group? Um, <clears throat> what are we looking for? We are looking uh, something that when it leaves, it is nice and stable. And the typical leaving groups that we look at are uh, chlorine, bromine, and, uh, and, and iodine as, as leaving groups. But I want to just expand a little bit more on this because this is an important uh, principle to understand uh, in organic chemistry, is just knowing that definition. And it, it is very, very vital that you know that a good leaving group uh, is the conjugate base of a strong acid. 
It's the conjugate base of a strong acid. All right, a good leaving group is the conjugate base of a strong acid. We've seen that Br minus is a good leaving group. Why? Because it's the conjugate base of HBr, which is a strong acid. All right, it wants to donate its proton, so this is the conjugate base. It's a weak, weak base, and therefore it is a good leaving group. So <clears throat> bromine, chlorine, iodine, they're all parts of very strong acids, good leaving groups. But there is an important one which you need to learn uh, in this course, because those are the acids like that. But what about H2SO4? H2SO4, you also know, is a really, really strong acid, and its conjugate base would look like this, HOSO4 minus. Um, so this would be a very, very good leaving group. Uh, but actually, in organic chemistry, it's very difficult to have these things sitting on a molecule. Uh, we actually have organic versions of this, and these are called the sulfonic acids. They all look like this. Instead of, instead of having uh, four oxygens, they've only got three, and there's some form of organic component that's part of it. And one of the most famous ones, which uh, you'll see over and over again, is the toluene substituent over there. All right, that's, that's toluene, para-substituted toluene, and that's a sulfonic acid. This is an organic version of sulfuric acid, and so the O- minus version of that is a really, really good leaving group, and you're going to see that in... Uh, in this course. This thing over here is sometimes shortened down to tosic acid. The TS stands for tosic acid and tosic itself is a shortened form of paratoluene sulfonic acid. All right, so it's tosic. <laughs> becomes part of that over there. All right, this is an important one for this course. It takes us a level up from all our inorganic acids, and so we need to uh, <clears throat> need to learn about that. All right, so uh, that's just an overview now of, of reactions. We've looked at nucleophiles, electrophiles, what are good, what are bad. We've looked at the general ideas of uh, what gets reactions going, it's orbitals, it's charges, the steric hindrance that, that, that's involved. And we've also looked at this important fact and feature over here uh, that's connected with the electrophiles, and that is what is a good leaving group. All right.